Solar power takes energy from the sun and depending on the type of solar panel uses this energy to heat water or generate electricity. Both types of panel work best when they face south. This way they get most sunlight. They'll work okay, though not as well, if they face southeast and southwest, but outside this range they won't get enough sun and will probably not be cost effective. And yes, solar panels in Australia do face north. Solar panels also need to be tilted at an angle of about 35 degrees, which is about the same as the average pitched roof. If the panels are installed on a flat roof or even standing on the ground, they are placed on frames which tilt them at the optimum angle to get the most sun. Solar panels obviously don't like shade, particularly if they're the electricity generating type. Shadows cast by near buildings and trees could make the panels ineffective. The type of solar system that heats water is known as solar thermal. Solar thermal can work very well for the hot water demands of homes, community centres, schools and swimming pools. It's especially suitable for venues with high usage during the summer months, such as outdoor pools and cricket pavilions. Solar thermal panels are essentially shallow metal boxes with glass or clear plastic covers. They are insulated from behind and designed to absorb the heat of the sun and transfer this heat to a network of pipes inside the panel through which a mixture of water and antifreeze passes. On a very sunny day, this liquid can get very hot indeed. In most solar thermal systems, the hot liquid is pumped from the panel into a heat exchanger that is coiled inside a hot water tank, which stores the water you're going to actually use. The heated up mixture of water and antifreeze never comes into contact with the water in the tank, but it does cause it to heat up, and by so doing provides hot water for showers, baths, washing up and other purposes. Solar thermal is not usually for radiators. We'll talk a bit more about this later. The mixture, which is now quite cool, returns to the solar panel, where it is reheated by the sun and the cycle begins again. Because they get very hot, all solar thermal panels need to be fitted with some sort of venting mechanism to allow for expansion and a safety system to prevent scalding. Reputable installers will ensure both of these are done, but don't be afraid to check that they've considered this and ask them to explain how it will be done. Because you don't necessarily want to use all this hot water, the very instant it is heated, all solar thermal systems must have a hot water storage tank. If you already have a hot water tank, you can either have an extra cylinder that works in conjunction with it, or you can have an entirely new cylinder fitted. Single cylinder systems are taller and thinner than normal immersion tanks to allow for stratification of the water, but they do take up less space overall than having two separate tanks. Solar thermal panels come in two types, flat plate collectors and evacuated tube collectors. The main difference is that evacuated tube collectors contain a series of glass tubes through which the pipework containing the water and antifreeze mixture runs. There's a vacuum inside each tube, which means the temperature inside can get considerably higher than in a flat plate collector. There's also a small range of movement possible for each tube, meaning that if your roof's orientation is a little less than perfect, each individual tube can be rotated slightly so that they do face south. All of this means that evacuated tube collectors are more efficient than flat plate collectors, but being more sophisticated are also costlier and less robust. Let's face it. Hot water systems can be confusing, so here are three things to remember about solar thermal. First, most solar panels only heat the water that comes out of your hot taps. They don't heat the water in your radiators. In the vast majority of domestic and community scale situations, another energy source like a gas or biomass boiler will be required to run the central heating. This is because the water in most radiator systems is heated to 70 or 80 degrees and a solar thermal system that could adequately heat this volume of water would need to be very large. This is even more important in winter when heating is needed but there's little sunshine available. However, it is possible to combine a solar panel and a biomass heating system using a thermal store. This is a tank of water that stores heat when the sun is out or the biomass is burning for you to use later for either heating or hot water. 
Solar thermal systems can also be used to preheat the water in the central heating system, thus reducing the amount of energy needed to bring it up to radiated temperature. Secondly, in most systems, the liquid circulating through the solar panel is not the water that comes out of your taps. As we've already explained, the liquid circulating through the system is usually a mixture of water and antifreeze that stays sealed inside the solar panel and its pipework. The heat from it is transferred to your water by passing through a coil pipe in your hot water cylinder. Thirdly, it is possible to use a solar thermal system with a combi boiler. You can preheat the water that passes into your combi boiler using solar thermal. You need space for a small storage tank in order for this to work. So if you installed a combi because there was no space for a tank, this may be a problem. In addition, not all combi boilers are suitable. It must be fully modulating and designed to be able to take hot water in the inlet. A gas safe registered engineer can verify this for you. The type of solar energy that generates electricity is called solar photovoltaic or solar PV. Photovoltaic is a combination of the Greek word for light, photos, with the word volt and literally means the generation of electricity from light. PV panels or modules are made up of a set of solar cells that are connected to each other in series, i.e. in a single line. When light falls on the cell, electricity is produced. This electricity is then fed into an inverter, which changes the power from direct current to alternating current, which is the kind of electricity used by appliances like fridges or TVs. The amount of electricity produced is determined by the solar cell that receives the least sunlight. This is important because it means that if just one cell is in the shadow of a building or even just a lamppost, this can significantly reduce the production of electricity. Be careful about seasonal changes in the sun's height too. The sun is lower in the winter and therefore a tree that doesn't cast shade in June could be a problem in December. You'll hear people talk mainly of three types of PV panels, monocrystalline, polycrystalline and amorphous or thin film. Let's take a look at them in turn. Monocrystalline panels are made of cells of wafer-thin slices of silicon crystal, characterised by their distinctive pattern of small, bevel-edged squares that look black or dark blue. These are the most efficient panels available, but also the most expensive. They're also quite fragile, something to bear in mind on a public building where vandalism might be an issue. Polycrystalline panels are made of cells that are cut from an ingot of melted and recrystallized silicon. This gives them a very distinctive crackled shimmer. They're less efficient than monocrystalline, but a little cheaper. Both crystalline types of panel can be incorporated into glass or glass laminates so that they can be part of a window and offer partial shading. However, it's important to note that they also get quite warm and could cause the room below to overheat. Finally, you have amorphous or thin film panels. These can be flexible, allowing them to be bent and shaped, and they are much more robust. So if vandalism is a potential issue, they may be the best choice. They're much cheaper than crystalline panels, but only a third as efficient. So you need more of them to get the same output. However, they do perform quite well compared to crystalline panels on slightly cloudy days, or if partly shaded. And let's face it, we're talking about the UK's weather here. Their relative cheapness, robustness, and good performance in cloudy conditions can make them a very sensible choice, especially if you've got lots of suitable roof space. Solar PV systems don't have to be panels mounted to the roof, although these bolt-on systems are the cheapest. PV tiles and slates are also available, but they are more expensive. If fitted when the roof needed replacing anyway, you can offset the cost of new ordinary tiles, and they may be more acceptable on listed buildings such as churches. I hope this introduction to solar has given you some useful information and ideas. Thanks for watching.